Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing out its fruits. And as some of the Pharisees asked him, when the kingdom of God would come, he answered and said to them, the kingdom of God will not come with observation. And they would not say, behold, here it is, or behold, it is there, for lo, the kingdom of God is within you. Matthew 21, 43, Luke 17, 20 to 21. Cherished listeners, welcome to the Oracles of God radio broadcast, a biblical program that is run and sponsored by the Churches of Christ, which come your way every Wednesday, 5.30 a.m. on Radio Universe 105.7 FM. Let's go to God in prayer. Glory, honor, praise, and adoration be to your holy name continually. O God, our everlasting Father, we bless your holy name and say, Hallowed be your name. We thank you for your wonderful blessings you bestowed on us and ushering us into this Wednesday, the 18th of May, 2011. We humbly ask you, loving Father, to forgive us of all our sins we've committed against you in all forms, either unknowingly or by design. We pray, committing today's program unto your care once again, grant us good utterance and receptive hearts as speakers and listeners, respectively. May your grace be on all our listeners, O Lord, so that they may understand and act in accordance with your oracles. We do commit the entire staff of Radio Universe into many hands, especially the technicians, O Lord, that they may be able to transmit this, your words, and or the traitor to your audience. Begin and end successfully with us. In the name above all names, Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. Cherished listeners, we continue with a series of lessons we drawing from the theme, Eschatology. We saw on the exposition of selected misconstrued texts of the 144,000 people mentioned, in Revelation chapter 7 and 14. And the text we are discussing is Luke 12, 32, which reads as follows. Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. We are on the second part of the text with the topic, Kingdom. Last week, cherished listeners, we concluded the introductory aspect of the study by continuing with the definitions of some terms that will help us understand the topic very well. Some of the topics and the definitions we redefine for us to understand clearly are the following. Kingdom of God and Kingdom of Heaven. Kingdom of God and Kingdom of Heaven. We did learn last week that the Kingdom of God and the Kingdom of Heaven as used in the New Testament mean the same thing. For the phrases have reference to origin. The kingdom or sovereignty of God originates from heaven. The originator is God who is in heaven. Kingdom of God emphasizes from whom and kingdom of heaven emphasizes from where. Then we also look at this term kingship. Kingship. We also said this is a term that is used to express the governmental reign of deity 
in the heavenly realm over all that exists in the created world. God's kingship over that which he has created refers to his right to rule. God is not a, an appointed king. He is not a king by inheritance. The fact that he is created assumes that he reigns over that which he created. Therefore, when kingship is mentioned in reference to God, we should not make a mistake of defining it as an early king would mean. Neither should we define kingdom of God and kingdom of heaven as kingdoms we know on this earth. We also looked at headship, headship, and we said it is used as metaphor to express the control of deity over creation because he is the center of reference from which all things are upheld. In other words, the things that have been created are under the control of God. All things are upheld by the authority of God's power. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse number 3. Choicelessness, we also looked at the term lordship, and we said it refers to a master-servant relationship between God and man. Jesus is the Lord of all men. According to 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 15, Jesus is the Lord of all men. 1 Timothy 6, 15, when one therefore submits to his lordship, then he has submitted himself to obey the commandments of his Lord. However, though one does not submit to the lordship of Jesus, this does not mean that Jesus is not his Lord. We must remember that God's relationship in the areas of kingship, headship, and lordship are not determined by the will of man. God will continue to carry out his positions of work and relationship with the created world regardless of the rebellion of man. This is very important for us to understand before we have an in-depth discussion with the term kingdom. Because the fact that you will see that it seems that there is death around, there are disobedient ones around, then the kingdom that Jesus promised has not come. It's a grave mistake to think that way. That is why it's important for us to discuss this time before we begin learning the topic about the kingdom. We are saying that it is not literal. Most of the kingdom we're talking about here, the Bible, Jesus said that it is not something of, that is observable. However, it is in our hearts as we shall come to it. And therefore, we need to understand this and not make a mistake to think that when we talk of kingdom of God, then it means that everything, everybody should obey whether the person like it or not. That is not the issue here. The issue about the lordship is that Jesus is Lord, irrespective of whether some will obey him or not. Still, he is their Lord. God will continue to carry out his positions of work and relationship with the created world, regardless of the rebellion of man. We also did look at forever and everlasting. Forever and everlasting. Last week, we said in the Old Testament, the Hebrew word, olam, olam, is used to define everlasting and forever, with emphasis on quality of existence rather than time without end. For instance, the Passover, Aaron's priesthood, Caleb's inheritance, Solomon's temple, God's covenant with Israel, and Gehazi's leprosy were all referred to be everlasting, but you bear me out that they are no more. The meaning of everlasting, therefore, in the many Old Testament prophecies was surety or certainty of existence, throughout their intended time of duration. Cherishlessness, as we were concluding last week, we also did mention the kingdom reigns of God that the Bible makes mention of and found out to be five. We did say that there are five clear kingdoms that the Bible talked about in relation with God and man. And we should not mistakenly confuse one with the other. We should not mistakenly define one for the other. And that is what we did end last week. We did say that there was a universal kingdom of deity that existed before the ascension of Jesus over which the Father was king and head. That was the first kingdom. Kingdom number two was the chosen Israelite kingdom before the ascension of Jesus over which the Father was king and head. Kingdom number three the universal kingdom of the Son that exists after the ascension 
over which Jesus is now king and head. So we are in the third kingdom where Jesus is the head of that kingdom. Kingdom number four, the chosen church as a manifestation of kingdom reign after the ascension over which the son is now king and head. Kingdom number four, the church. Kingdom number five, the heavenly kingdom to come where the father will again exercise kingship. Cherished listeners, these kingdoms should not be misconstrued and uh, misunderstood so as to get a clearer picture of what it each means. In the definition of the foundation of the biblical worldview, therefore, we did explain last week that the father was king and head with sovereignty over all things before the ascension of Christ. Two, the father was king and head over the nation of Israel before the ascension of Christ. Three, the kingship and headship of the sovereignty rule of deity changed from the father to the son at the ascension. Four, the son Jesus Christ is now king and head with sovereignty over all things. Five, the son Jesus Christ is now king and head with sovereignty over all things for the sake of the church and the son will return universal sovereignty to God at his final coming. If we are able to distinguish between this kingdom as such, we will not get confused. We will understand it. We will appreciate Jesus' rule currently. We will appreciate God's kingdom at any point in time and we will be ready for the final and the last kingdom which is no longer different but the kingdom Jesus has that he will hand over to the Father. Cherish listeners, today before we begin to discuss this kingdom race of God one by one, let us define one more term that will help us understand very well when we make reference to the term deity or Godhead as used in the Bible. We've talked about the Father, we are talking about the Son, some are already confused already. And that is why we need to just take about two minutes to make reference to the term deity or Godhead as used in the Bible. After which we will begin having the kingdoms one by one to discuss. Definition of the Godhead. Definition of the Godhead. There is a relationship, cherished listener, between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit that is not possible to fully communicate with human ways. I want to repeat, cherished listeners, there is a relationship between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit that is not possible to fully communicate with human words. No human words have been able to communicate fully the relationship between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So you see a lot of people interpreting it according to their whims, according to their doctrines, according to whatever they think the human mind can carry them. But we are cautioned that there is no single human word that will be able to fully explain spiritual things. More so about Godhead. If you know anything about God, then he ceases to be God. God is to be feared and out, and therefore the words that are used even to define the relationship between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we should be humble. We should be so humble to understand that no, it's not possible to fully communicate with human words. This relationship was somewhat revealed by Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3. The relationship between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit was somewhat revealed by Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3, and it reads as follows. But I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ, the head of woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. Churchlessness, if you take human words to interpret this, you may miss the point. It is difficult to understand the headship of God in relation to the Son. We often assume that the word God in this context refers to God the Father. Anytime we read First Corinthians 11 frame, we think that the God mentioned there, where we say the head of Christ is God, is only God the Father. However, 
we must understand that such is only an assumption. Throughout the Old Testament, we do not make this assumption, for we understand that the word God will refer to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. When we come to the New Testament, biblical interpreters often assume that there must of necessity be a division in the Godhead because of the specific manifestation of God through Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. However, this view must be challenged in many New Testament contexts where the word God is used. The statement of 1 Corinthians 11.3 will be one of those contexts. The head of Christ, therefore, will be God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Doesn't it sound interesting? The head of Christ is God. And that head of Christ, which is God, will be God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit again. Interesting. This will indicate that neither manifestation of God functions in his work separate or apart from the others. God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit work as one. And thus God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are the head of Christ, who was the incarnate manifestation of God. Cherishlessness, let us be humble when we talk about issues such as this. Do not let be so dogmatic and confuse our listeners that we teach or even deceive ourselves. God is always thought of as the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So that even if Christ is, uh, the Bible is saying that the head of Christ is God, the head of Christ is God, which is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Why in his incarnate state, the Son had a positional relationship with the Father in order to receive all things and all authority from the Father. The Father's relationship with the Son, therefore, has something to do with headship and authority to be given to the Son. The Son received and there will return authority to the Father at all after the final coming. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 28. This may indicate that there was permanency in the Son's incarnation. In other words, the Son shall remain forever in eternity with his brethren in the form of his resurrected body. From our perspective of a New Testament understanding of the work of the Father in the Old Testament, we would affirm that in relation to the Son's present reign, the Father maintains such in the history of the world until the ascension. From creation to the ascension, the Father was on the throne of authority in heavenly places. After the ascension, the Son was placed on this throne of authority over all things. After the final coming, the Father will again assume all authority over all things. God is one. However, the particular personality or deity who has authority over all things has changed throughout history. We would make this assumption based on understanding of the present reign of the Son that is clearly stated in the New Testament. Regardless of what happens in deity's relationship with all creature things, the relationship of deity in the Godhead stays the same. This is a very important point to understand. Regardless of what happens in deity's relationship with all creature things, the relationship of deity in the Godhead stays the same. God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. That relationship stays the same. Irrespective of whether the Father has been manifested, the relationship of God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit remains the same. Irrespective of the manifestation of the Son as Jesus, the relationship in the Godhead, Father, Son, Holy Spirit remains the same. Irrespective or regardless of the manifestation of the Holy Spirit in the form of our lives, the relationship between in the Godhead, Father, Son, Holy Spirit remains the same. Irrespective or regardless of Christ humbling himself, remaining as the Christ, the mediator between God and man, the relationship 
between God, uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit remains the same. It's unchangeable. It's intact. Never use human mind to define who God is. And that is a very important thing we need to understand as we begin pondering into this wonderful study of kingdom. So that you will not ask the question, if Jesus is now king of kings and lord of laws, and the head of the kingdom, then why is he saying that he's the mediator between God and man? Oh, you've come back to human thinking once again. That is why it's important to understand this before we move on. The relationship between God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit remains intact, irrespective of their relationship with all created things. Cherish listeners. Though the divine headship and kingship in relation to deity's reign over creation changes, the relationship of deity within the Godhead never changes. God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is God. God is all in all. We have to make some assumptions concerning the nature of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Every interpreter has to do such lest he be accused of creating a God in his own image in order to understand God. However, though we may not understand that all is involved in the relationship of the three manifestations of God in order to carry out the scheme of redemption, this does not detract from our efforts to understand the revelation of Scripture concerning the kingdom reign of God over all things. We accept what is revealed in the Scriptures concerning the reign of the Father and Son, regardless of our inability to understand that which is in the realm of deity, we must accept what is revealed in the Bible concerning the relationship of God with this material world. At the same time, we must not attach undue limitations to the reign of God with our inability to understand that which is beyond this world. And with this wonderful final definition in the introduction, we venture into the wonderful study of the kingdom of God. We are beginning with kingship and headship of the Father. Kingship and headship of the Father. As we take them one by one, remember that regardless of who sits on the throne at any point in time, the relationship between God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit remains unchanged. And God is all in all. The Bible teaches that the Father was king and head over all things before the ascension of Christ. A principal point to learn here is that God the Father was a king and exercised headship over all nations. Angels and Satan were under him before the establishment of the kingdom of Israel. Understanding this point is crucial to understanding the extent of the kingdom reign of the Son at this present time. If we minimize the present kingdom reign of the Son, then we would minimize the reign of God before the ascension, because the extent of the kingdom reign of the Father before the ascension was given to the Son at the ascension without reduction in any form. The above must be understood in relation to the Son's reign overall, that has been created. It will not refer to the son's relationship with the father and son. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 27, Paul revealed, For he has put all things under his feet. But when he says, All things are put under him, it is evident that he who put all things under him is accepted. In other words, all things have been presently put under the kingdom reign of the son. All things have been put under the reign of the incarnate Son except the Father. Because, irrespective of who rules, the relationship in the Godhead remains intact. Jesus now has kingdom reign over all things except for God, the Father, who is the head of Christ. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 3. In his pre-existence incarnation, we would assume that the positional relationship of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit did not exist as it did after the incarnation. God was, in quote, us. God was referred to as us, U.S., 
as plural. God was referred to as singular plural, as, as expressed in Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 to 27. Let us make man in our image. Let us make man in our image. Let us means God. Angels never created and did not create. All creatures never created. And so let us, that is God, make man in our image. However, after the Son gave up being on equality with God, God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit eternally remains the head of the Son who incarnated into man in order to first redeem man and then to eternally dwell with his brethren in a new heavens and earth that is yet to come. Cherish listeners, let's listen again. That's, however, after the Son gave up being on an equality with God, Humbling himself, God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit eternally remains the head of the Son who incarnated into man in order to first redeem man and then to eternally dwell with his brethren in a new heavens and earth that is yet to come. Philippians 2, 6-7, to 2 Peter 3, 13. In our studies, therefore, of the Father and Son, in relation to all that has been created, we will refer to God over all things in the Old Testament to our primary reference to the work of the Father. We will make this assumption because of the emphasis in the New Testament on the sons having received kingdom from the Father. What the Father had in deity's relationship to the created world before the ascension was given to the Son when he ascended to the right hand of the Father. We want to emphasize, therefore, that the Father was universal king before the ascension. The Father was universal king over all things before the establishment of the Israelite kingdom. An examination of a concordance will reveal many passages that state the universal kingship of the Father over all creation before the ascension. David wrote in Psalm 10, verse 16, Psalm 10, verse 16, the Lord is king forever and ever. Then again he said in Psalm 24 verse 10, Psalm 24 verse 10, the Lord of hosts, he is the king of glory. Again in Isaiah chapter 33 verse 2, Isaiah 33 verse 2, he said the Lord is our king. The Lord is our king. Psalm 44 verse 4, Psalm 44 verse 4, Say, you are my king, O God. You are my king, O God. Psalm 22, 27 to 28. Psalm 22, 27, 28 states, All the ends of the world shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations shall worship before you. For the kingdom is the Lord's, and he rules over the nation. Psalm 22, verse 27 and 28. Cherish listeners, the preceding statements that are made in the Psalms and Isaiah clearly affirm the kingship of the Father that was in existence before the ascension. He was king. There was a kingdom. And he reigned. This all existed before the establishment of the nation of Israel. Before the Old Testament law was given and a covenant was made with the Jews on Mount Sinai, the Father reigned over all things. For Exodus chapter 15 verse 18 reads again, The law shall reign forever and ever. God had given the law of his sovereignty to the fathers by the prophets. Hebrews 1, 1. Though God was the sovereign king of all things, there were still disobedient subjects. That is what we need to understand. That even though God was the sovereign king of all things, as the passages are saying, there were still disobedient subjects as there are in every kingdom reign. The fact that they are disobedient subjects doesn't mean God's kingdom, particular kingdom you talk about, hadn't come. In other words, the fact that disobedient individuals, nations and angels were allowed to exist under his sovereignty does not mean that the father was not king over them and over all. Disobedience does not negate the sovereign rule of deity. This is a very important point and one that must be considered in reference to the Son's present reign over all things. Some are claiming that 
since there are still disobedient people in the world, then the kingdom that Jesus promised about hadn't come. That is false. That's why we are taking a clue from what happened to the Father's kingdom, where the Bible affirmed clearly that he was king of all. However, there were disobedient subjects all over. Simply because the demons were disobedient, subjects did not mean that Jesus, even while in his incarnate state, did not have authority over them. Luke chapter 8 and verse number 28. God's sovereignty over all things does not violate the free moral agency of man. Neither does the free moral agency of man negate the sovereignty of God. Simply because God allows man the ability to make free will choices, though often rebellious, does not mean that God is not reigning over the rebellious. This point must be clearly understood in order to understand that God's sovereign reign is not limited by the rebellion of any or many subjects. An interesting passage we read when we're reading Isaiah. When we're reading Isaiah and the prophecy about the kingdom. When we're reading Daniel, also about the prophecy of the kingdom. Especially in Daniel chapter 9, where the Bible pro uh, claimed that Jesus received authority from the Father. When the Son ascended to the ancient of days, to him was given nations and authority. And a certain word was used, that all nations should bow down to him. It, it means it's a force. It is an obligation. All nations should bow down to him. Whether the devil likes it or not, he bows down to Jesus. All nations should bow down to him. It means that there will be some who will be disobedient. However, that will never negate the authority of the son over his kingdom. In the book of Revelation, the Bible said that Jesus will rule with a rod of iron and is ruling with a rod of iron and in the midst of his enemies. So it tells you that the kingdom that Jesus was talking about is a kingdom that he will reign in the midst of his enemies. Why do we claim that the kingdom hasn't come? Just because there are his enemies around. But Jesus never said that in the time that, that he will rule, his enemies will not be there. So we take a clue from the first kingdom mentioned in the Bible where the father was king overall, there were the disobedient people, there were the disobedient people to the point that he destroyed the whole world apart from one family, remember. And so God was king and his kingdom was here. He was ruling the affairs of men and he would do whatever he wished and anything he wanted to say. And this is very, very important for us. That is why we are taking our time, taking the number of kingdoms mentioned in the Bible one by one. When we remember that God has never left his kingdom to any man, it is not true that the devil has taken away God's kingdom. It is not true. If you, if the Bible says that the devil is the God of this world, the world stands for all filthy things, lust of the eye, lust of the flesh, and pride of life. That is what the word refers to. He's not talking about that spiritual world, that boundaryless world, where God has created a face and rules in the face of man, including the devil himself. So do not make that mistake to think that in this world the devil is the king. The kingdom belongs to the devil. That is a great blasphemous thing that we can say. God has never, deity has never, allow any other being apart from the deity to rule as the head of the kingdom. There has never been any space that God's kingdom has not been around. It has always been around. It is only changed in the headship. However, the relationship between the Godship itself remains intact. That is why it surpasses the understanding of carnal mind. And we need to be humble and accept that the kingdom of God at any point in time is with us. And we need to be obedient to God's laws, irrespective of their rulership, their leadership, and the type of laws that he gives to a particular group of people. Cherished listeners, 
As I told you, this is a wonderful topic. When we begin to learn these things, our faith increases that God is over all and he sees all. He never slumbers nor sleeps. He sees everything in your affairs, your secret chambers, in your marrow, your bones, innermost bones. He sees all and will do whatever you are asking him to do for you. For you. All that you need to do is to subject yourself to this lordship. For he alone is sovereign, irrespective of the age. Though it tarries, though you think it is keeping too long, you need to understand from these studies we are having that God has a sign and he is overall. No one can beat him, irrespective of what strategy the person who put in place. Shall we therefore renew our allegiance to this wonderful Godhead? This wonderful deity that rules in the affairs of men. Today we have looked at the relationship between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we say it is unchangeable, irrespective of their display in the world, in incarnation form. We have also said that irrespective of who sits on the throne, they work together and it is one God and that is what we need to know. We have said that as the first kingdom being mentioned in the Bible, it was the kingdom that there is an assumption that the father was king. And the Bible mentions categorically that the father was king until the ascension that he handed over. And that is what the passages in the Old Testament have proven for us. God willing, next week, we shall continue with the next, the second kingdom being mentioned in the Bible. And by the end, we'll finish with these five kingdoms, and we believe that you'll be blessed. And you will renew your allegiance very well. Understand the topic about this kingdom and you become an obedient subject to his lordship. So that when he comes, we shall all be saved. We will be in this kingdom and be handed over gloriously to the Father to enjoy forever. Once again, this has been the Oracles of God radio broadcast, a biblical program that is run and sponsored by the Churches of Christ on Radio Universe 105.7 FM. Every Wednesday, 5.30 a.m., make a day with us, same time, God willing, next week, as God continues to unravel his mysteries through his words to redeem us from the deception of the devil. You are warmly invited to worship with churches of Christ all over the country, the pillar of truth, where unadulterated words of God are shared. You may want to call us on 020-424-2420 or 0245527658 or send us a message on coc.radio at yahoo.com My name is Eric Dacon. Now may the Lord bless us and keep us. The Lord make his face shine upon us and be gracious unto us. The Lord lift up his countenance upon us and give us peace now and forevermore. Till we meet again, stay richly blessed in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen and good morning. Good morning.